Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. Seven weeks in, just where does the world stand with the conflict in Ukraine? And what hope, if any, is there now for peace? As the conflict in Ukraine continues, the Kremlin is insisting it's committed to easing tensions in the region. So, is it possible we may be close to an endgame? And what exactly might that look like? Later in the programme, we'll be talking to Alexander Stubb, the former Prime Minister of Finland, who helped to broker a ceasefire between Russia and Georgia back in 2008. But first, let's get the view from Moscow. Joining me now is Russian Federation Senator Konstantin Kosachev. Um, Konstantin, in December, you said that Russia wasn't preparing to enter Ukraine militarily, and you called such reports a provocation. Did you genuinely not know that military action was about to happen? Uh, at that moment, I believe nobody uh, ever expected this uh, operation to take place for the simple reason we uh, did not uh, monitor any preparations for any military attack from the Ukrainian side. We started to uh, see that kind of preparations sometime in early February. More than that, we received uh, reliable uh, intelligence information uh, early in February that the plans to use military force against Donbas and further on against Crimea are scheduled uh, at the beginning of March, uh, to be more exact, exactly on the 8th of March. This is the information we received prior to the decision of President Putin to uh, start uh, the Russian special operation, which in uh, this context definitely was a response, definitely was a preemptive measure, definitely was a defensive a, a uh, response in order to prevent uh, any any uh, bigger uh, bloodshed. A, a response or a preemptive measure? Which one was it? Well, a preemptive measure, but uh, as you perfectly well know, and everybody hopefully knows, the uh, Ukrainian military operation against Donbas, against regions in southeastern Ukraine, did take place the previous eight years. The previous eight years, while the so-called Minsk agreements uh, were in force, and uh, the basic idea of these agreements was a political dialogue between the conflicting parts inside of Ukraine in order to reach a political agreement. Where, where do you think the conflict stands now? Well, it, it develops. We have uh, two tracks, the military track, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, it depends on who uh, evaluates the situation. The capabilities of the Ukrainian military force is uh, now pressed down. And uh, we proceed, I mean, the Russian military force proceeds, uh, makes progress in, the, in terms of this special operation. But the uh, parallel track is negotiations, which uh, take place regularly and uh, does uh, bring uh, certain progress, certain uh, mutual understanding of the problems which are to be solved. So we are somewhere in the middle of the process and somewhere in between the two tracks. And uh, hopefully we uh, have already overcome the lowest, the lowest point in this development and uh, have now possibilities to reach the final solution, whether in military terms or in political terms. It, it depends. The choice depends 100 percent on how uh, Kyiv reacts on that and whether uh, the West supports Kyiv in denying any political compromises or motivates Kyiv to accept political compromises with Russia. Um, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is insisting that Russia is committed to easing tension in the region. Uh, how could that be achieved? The total withdrawal of Russian forces, would that be a way forward? No. Uh, you know, the decision to start the Russian uh, special operation was taken, uh, taking into consideration, sorry for this, uh, taking into consideration the uh, well-predictable 
perspectives in case this operation uh, wouldn't have taken place later in some weeks, in some months, probably in some years. But we would be definitely have a big military conflict between Russia on one side and NATO countries using Ukraine as a weapon on the other side. And uh, the Russian military operation has created uh, possibilities, has created an option of uh, escaping this big war, which could have developed into a third world war. So to ease tensions means simply that we prevent this development to happen. We want to see Ukraine as an independent, sovereign, neutral, free from uh, military alliances country, which does not create any military threats towards its neighbors, Russia included. Sergei Lavrov has also said that Russia remains committed to the continuing peace talks. Uh, have they moved forward at all uh, over the last few weeks? Yes, I believe that we have reached certain progress in some parts of our negotiations, uh, in mainly uh, talking about the future security status, security arrangements, uh, collective security uh, guarantees uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, on both sides, understand perfectly well that eventual uh, entrance of Ukraine uh, into NATO will uh, just create new problems for uh, collective security in Europe, for national security of Ukraine. So this option is not valid any longer, and it is recognized by, uh, by Kyiv. They are ready to introduce certain amendments in their constitution if needed. But what is most important, they are ready to stop demanding Ukrainians' membership in NATO. We have some additional uh, mutual understandings, as far as I, as far as I am informed, uh, concerning the military activities of third countries on the territory of Ukraine, which will be possible only if agreed between the countries which will uh, be uh, guaranteeing, uh, guaranteeing the security of Ukraine. Okay, this is a essential step forward, but uh, still we have uh, many more things to discuss and to uh, I'm sure that there are, I'm sure there are many other point, things but, to discuss, but I wonder if the quickest way forward would be for President Putin to talk directly to President Zelensky. Uh, only in case we know what these talks will be about, because uh, as for now, these talks will definitely be used by Mr. Zelensky in order to blame Mr. Putin for everything possible and to uh, position himself as the only defender of sovereignty and independence of Ukraine. The uh, talks which are not well prepared will just uh, create additional problems, not solutions. So these talks are to be prepared, and this is what happens inside the negotiation process. President Zelensky said it would be difficult to talk to President Putin at the moment because of the accusations of war crimes against the president. I, I may talk about that in more details. It's not needed. But uh, believe me, it's absolutely difficult for us to continue to talk to Mr. Zelensky, uh, creating that kind of provocations, which does not, does not uh, assist the negotiation process at all. But nevertheless, negotiations continue, and hopefully they will, at the end, uh, give a result which will make it's possible to, to meet personally, uh, I mean, Mr. Uh, Putin and Mr. Zelensky. We are, are you, not there yet. Then. Both the US and the UK insist that war crimes are being committed. Um, the Kremlin is now saying that Europe will have to establish dialogue with Russia in the future. How do you think that dialogue could look uh, when you consider the accusations flying around at the moment? As a diplomat. To start somewhere. To start somewhere. We could have had a good discussion on that within the Security Council of the United Nations. Russia has demanded an extra meeting of that Security Council, and that demand was blocked by the United Kingdom. They did not want to talk about that in the Security Council, and did not, they did not find anything extraordinary in that situation in Busha the day before yesterday and yesterday. For me, this is self-explanatory. This is where the dialogue is to take place. This is where evidences are to be exchanged. But the Western countries do not want to have that dialogue openly, publicly, 
they just prefer to continue to produce false ex uh, accusations towards Russia and against Russia. And this is the style we will never accept because we know the truth. But you must feel um, uh, you're in a very difficult position as a diplomat to see Russia so increasingly isolated from the rest of the world. Do you feel Russia is standing alone? Definitely not. Definitely not. I, I know perfectly well that the uh, United Nations consists of 193 countries. I know perfectly well that just uh, 40 countries, 40 countries plus, uh, practice sanctions against Russia. 40 countries out of 193 is more, is less than one fifth. It is not the international community. It's not the majority. And Russia definitely does not feel isolated. It, uh, the, the feeling of uh, an isolated Russia may appear only if you look at Russia from Washington or uh, the Brussels, for example. But we have so many other places which are different from the Western world and which are still balanced, which are still very much uh, concerned about the NATO expansion, which are very much concerned about the attempts of the Western world to create a unipolar uh, construction of this world. So definitely Russia is not isolated. Russia is definitely not alone. And Russia definitely will not give up because some 40 countries uh, see the future of the world differently. Lastly, uh, Constantine, what does success in this special military operation look like to you? Wh where would it end? Uh, for me, as a Russian citizen, uh, the success story is that we in Russia feel secure, including those Russian citizens which live in Crimea, including those people citizens of Russia or citizens of other countries who live in uh, southeastern Ukraine, in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk republics, security for people of different nationalities, speaking different languages, who live in Ukraine, so they, that they would not be afraid of Nazi groups, radical groups, killing civilians for uh, speaking other languages or experiencing uh, other uh, traditions or cultures. I uh, think that the success story for whole Europe will be security arrangements, which we proposed, by the way, in December last year, which will be in inclusive, not exclusive, which will be equal for every European country, and uh, so that we will have a security arrangement which will be indivisible. That's, for me, a success story, and I hope that the Russian military operation is a very good step forward in reaching that desired situation. Russian Federation Senator Konstantin Kosachev, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. Thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, talking peace in Ukraine. And we'll be hearing from the former Finnish Prime Minister, Alexander Stubb. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Uh, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history. Far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So now we've actually become the border on this road. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control... The economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. The focus is family on future technologies. Well, this is something completely different. The world today, every day, on CGTN.
Have you ever wondered how much a human life is worth? Have you ever looked up at the night sky and considered whether aliens are staring back? Or if it's even possible to measure intelligence? If that sounds like you, it's time to join The Answers Project with me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. We've recruited the best brains in the world, award-winning astrophysicists, giants of medical science, and former presidential advisors to help us tackle humanity's biggest questions. Find The Answers wherever you get your podcasts. We can try out the wild and the crazy ideas. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we're trying to save the world. Oh, no. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Welcome back to the agenda. Weeks into the conflict in Ukraine, peace talks are continuing in an attempt to bring an end to the crisis. But just what might the two sides really have to negotiate with or about? And what it's really like to be part of such talks? One man who knows better than most is the former Prime Minister of Finland, Alexander Stubb, who broke the peace deal in Georgia in 2008. And he joins me now from Helsinki. Alexander, what's your take on where we are now in this conflict in Ukraine? Probably the impasse. Uh, and, you know, if you compare it to the war in Georgia, I think the stakes are much bigger here. Uh, we were able to broker a ceasefire in Georgia in five days, and now we're basically five weeks into this conflict. And the reason is simple. The stakes for Putin are too high, and I don't think we're anywhere near a ceasefire agreement because the two warring parties are so far apart. And the sanctions uh, have been the big weapon so far by the West to try and bring some kind of peace deal. Um, they were introduced at an unprecedented pace. In your experience, do sanctions work? Well, yes and no. I mean, the idea of sanctions is basically to send a clear message that there is a cost uh, of war. And obviously, the wave of sanctions that the European Union has produced in a very short time is unprecedented. Basically, we're moving towards a stage where Russia will be completely isolated, politically, economically, financially, sport, transport, and eventually also energy. So it will work in the long run, but never underestimate the capacity of the Russian people to suffer and sustain discomfort and pain. Isolating a country, does that bring the leader of that country to the table? It probably should, but you never know with the Russians, because in the Russian psyche is this sense that they have always been isolated. I personally think that Putin miscalculated. He never thought that the West or the international community would be so united against his uh, aggression. And what he really wanted, the exact reverse has happened. He wanted a disunited Europe. Well, it's never been as united as it is right now. He wanted to decouple the transatlantic partnership. Well, it's got rejuvenated. And on top of that, NATO's back on the stage and Finland and Sweden will probably join NATO eventually. So I think, um, you know, in order to protect his legacy, he did a huge, huge miscalculation. One last question about sanctions, Alexander. Can you, can you give me an example of where sanctions have produced a peace? Well, you know, South Africa, uh, it sort of abolished apartheid. Uh, in Iran, we ended up getting uh, a deal. Uh, in North Korea, it hasn't. But uh, do we really want to see Russia become a new North Korea? I don't know. And, of course, we are still negotiating uh, with Iran on that nuclear deal. Uh, there was one, and then there wasn't one, and now they're trying to get another one. But uh, let's, stay, let's stay with Ukraine. Do you think the West is doing enough to try and end the conflict? Yes, I think they're doing everything they can. You see the instruments at disposal are a little bit different from what one is used to, say, in, for instance, World War II. So the instruments of war in this particular case, uh, they are the sanctions that we talked about. They're financial instruments. Uh, they are financial aid to Ukraine. Uh, and they're armaments. And also this portrayal 
I think, of uh, solidarity. So it is probably almost everything that the European Union can do at the moment. You were part, as I said at the beginning, of the negotiating team in Georgia in 2008. You negotiated then with uh, Mr. Putin, then Prime Minister, or nominal uh, Prime Minister. What did you learn about him which may be of use now? Well, uh, actually, to correct it a little bit, I did the negotiation in Georgia together with Foreign Minister Bernard Kushner, and our counterpart at the time was President Shakasvili. And then I flew to Moscow and was dealing with Sergei Lavrov. And then President Sarkozy of France came to deal with President Medvedev and Putin. Now, I have met Putin uh, a few times. Uh, what are the lessons to be drawn? The lessons are very simple. He's very well prepared. He's very analytical. And all of those people who think that he's irrational or has lost his marbles because of COVID isolation, I don't think they know what they're talking about. And to be honest, I think uh, they are barking up the wrong tree. You have to understand what he's trying to achieve. He wants to make Russia great again. That is his aim. And that is the rationality of his actions. Whether then uh, they end up achieving what he wants is a completely different story. When you were negotiating about Georgia, you came up with a plan, a five-point peace plan, in less than a week. Um, how did that process work? And how did you come up with a plan so quickly? Well, it was pretty simple. There's this sort of, you know, frenzy of uh, diplomatic phone calls. Uh, and then when we arrived in Belize, we basically opened my laptop and started drafting traditional points for a possible ceasefire agreement, which had to do, obviously, with the withdrawal of troops of both sides. It had to do with the notion of a ceasefire and also respecting territorial uh, integrity and creating humanitarian corridors. So you use sort of a set language that you usually have in ceasefires. Now, rumors are that the ceasefire agreement that is being discussed, uh, or at least allegedly discussed, has over 15 points. So it's probably a completely di different kettle of fish. And the reason is simple. This conflict, this war, is much more complicated than the one we had in Georgia in August 2008. So how do you read, Alexander, the current negotiations? To be honest, uh, you know, these things are usually gradual. So you start with second-tier diplomats. Then you start moving into first-tier diplomats. Then you might get some politicians involved. And the big shots, say, President Putin or President Zelensky, do not get involved uh, unless there is a really deal imminent. So therefore, I can just conclude that we're nowhere near a ceasefire agreement at this particular stage. OK, do you know or can you guess at what the options are on the table? Uh, to be honest, I don't see many options. And I say this also as the chairman of the board of Marti Ahtisari's Peace Foundation, CMI. He knew one or two things about mediating peace, whether it was, you know, Namibia or Kosovo or Aceh or Northern Ireland, there you usually have some kind of a ballpark that you're dealing with. But listen, if Putin says basically that he wants to take over uh, Ukraine and denazify Ukraine, which basically means changing the government, and then Zelensky says that he wants to defend the territorial sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine, there isn't really that much you can do. That's why we're still in this war, unfortunately. Is the bottom line, Alexander, some kind of face-saving uh, formula for Mr. Putin? Well, I think there are really three options here. One is that he withdraws, tries to save his face back home, uh, which with information war is possible, but in reality is quite difficult. Because, you know, from what I understand, it's already about 75% of Russian troops engaged. Uh, and they haven't achieved their goals, which were supposed to happen in 48 hours. They haven't been able to do that in, in five uh, weeks. The second option is some kind of a divided uh, Ukraine, east and west, whatever that means in terms of uh, territory. Could be a possible face-saver for Putin, but I just don't know and I don't see uh, how Zelensky could do that. The third option is, of course, that uh, Putin starts using more serious military uh, means, which would begin, of course, with chemical weapons and then move into nuclear warheads. I don't believe that he will go this far, especially with the nuclear side. Earlier, you talked about NATO and Finland possibly joining NATO. 
when you were prime minister, was there a feeling Finland should join NATO? Because the current polls suggest there is a large amount of public support for joining NATO. And if so, how much more would that antagonize the, the, the Kremlin? Well, I guess on the first question, it depends on who you're opposing it to. I have always been an advocate of NATO membership, but I was in a very distinct minority. 50% of the population were against NATO membership, roughly 20% in favor. And to be honest, uh, I believed in the values that NATO stands for uh, as a defense alliance of democratic nations, but took a lot of hit, hits, political hits uh, in a democracy because of that. Now, with uh, the war in uh, Ukraine, Finnish opinion polls have reversed 180 degrees and then more. In other words, we now have 61 to 62 percent in favor of NATO membership and roughly 16 to 19 percent uh, against. And I think Finns in this particular situation are driven by realistic and rational fear, which basically means that we never want to be left alone again in the face of a grand aggressor in the same way we were when the Soviet Union attacked us uh, in the Winter War during World War II. I was going to ask you about the changes you think this has meant for Europe and Finland joining NATO would be a major one, wouldn't it, because uh, of this conflict? Well, I think it's a natural step uh, in the ultimate westernization of Finland. The membership in the European Union after the Cold War was one example, and now joining NATO is another one. Of course, it means uh, a lot. Uh, but to be honest, we have been very NATO compatible ever since the 1990s. We bought uh, over 60 F-18s. We just uh, acquired or purchased another 64 F-35s. We do NATO training exercises. We have been involved in NATO missions in, for instance, Afghanistan. So really the only thing we don't have is Article 5. But there is a change. We have to understand that this is not only about Russia versus the West, it is about the global order. And the way in which we should read the UN vote is to say that, yes, 141 states against Russia, yes, four for Russia, and then 35 abstain. But those 35, they represent roughly 50% of the world's population. So I think a key state here uh, is China. And we in the West have to understand that the international order has been created in the image of the victors of World War II and in many ways in the image uh, of the West. So if something comes out of this, we need to think about the global order anew and what that means. And that will require cooperation between China and the West. Do you think, in summary, uh, Alexander, this conflict will be solved only on the battlefield or around the negotiating table? You always need both, you know? I mean, every war is like that. You fight it out in the battlefield and then eventually there is peace and peace negotiation. The thing is, we just don't know how long this is going to last. You know, the winter war in Finland lasted 105 days. The war in Korea was longer. The war in Afghanistan was 10 years. So we simply don't know. So first, there will be military conflict, as we can see, and then eventually there will be peace. But be and rest assured, this will not be forgotten by the rest of the world, and especially not by Europeans or Ukrainians. Ukraine, from now on, is European, not Russia. Alexander Stubb, many thanks to you, Alexander, for joining us on the agenda. My pleasure. Thanks. Don't forget you can watch everything from past Agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future agenda. Heading to the polls, we'll be discussing the issues facing France's next president, but for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye.